Hi, everyone. So, um, I hope that everyone has had an amazing day. Yeah? Yeah? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. That's better. The reason that I wanted to come on board to work on GCAP was because GCAP is a particularly unique, powerful, and special event. Uh, and our closing keynote is a particularly unique, special, and powerful woman. Um, I mentioned at, during my opening remarks that Kate is one of the most incredible women I've ever met. Uh, and you're about to find out why. <laughs> Kate has been an incredible advocate for the global industry uh, for the past five years as the executive director of the IGDA and before that um, in a variety of different roles and capacities. Uh, Kate's new adventure is very exciting uh, and uh, I hope that she tells us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. But what I love most about, the, about Kate is that she truly believes that games can make the world a better place um, and that we are the people to do that. Uh, she travels around the world to convince us that we can do that. And I think that that's really awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Kate Edwards. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. So it's a great honor to be back here. I spoke at GCAP four years ago, and uh, a lot has changed. This is a lot bigger than it was four years ago. The city is growing as well. Um, I love Melbourne. It's one of my favorite places. I'm not just saying that because I'm here. I'm based in Seattle, and actually, to me, Seattle and Melbourne have a lot of similarities. So I remember the first time I visited here, it was just one of those places where like, I could totally live here. It just feels totally comfortable, including the weather. So. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today, I, I, it's, a, it's an honor to be asked to come back and speak, especially as the closing keynote, and especially on this topic about the ripple effect, because as if those of you who know me or know my history, I did run the IGDA for five years. Um, I made a lot of noise during that time, or at least I tried to as best as I could. Um, but I've not always been an advocate at all. Um, I've never been, um, I've never been on a path to aspire to be an advocate. And so, when I first proposed this talk, I was full of rage, as I am now, and you'll find that out very soon. Um, it's going to come through very loud and clear in this talk. Um, there's a reason there's Mjolnir hammered into my slide. Um, but I didn't want to focus just on the rage part. We can all be ragey, and we'll, we'll get to that. But what I wanted to talk about was how I got there. Because the ripple effect and that idea of how you make a difference, I think the journey that I took, which I'm calling the advocate's journey as opposed to the hero's journey, you can add whatever name you want for yourself in there, um, but there is a tie to the whole hero thing, as you'll see. And um, I thought it would be important to focus on that too, the path to how I got to where I got to this point where I actually decided that things need to change, and I'm willing to be that person to speak up. So, former executive director, I went around the world speaking a lot. Um, I don't, that vest is now in my closet. It was with me for all five years. It became, became not only a sign that, you know, uh, there she is across the room, because I'm not tall enough to find, um, but also uh, it was a big target on my back, as I'll mention later. This was a great experience. This is an experience that was very unique. Very few people in our industry get the chance to be in a position where we get to talk to developers of every possible kind you can imagine around the world, from massive AAA companies in the you know, San Francisco, Seattle, Berlin, places like that, to emerging markets like Tunisia, Colombia, um, you know, you name it, around the world. And it's just been a fantastic experience. I talked to government leaders, to government ministers. Um, I went to game jams, I went to studios, to startups, large studios, small studios. Uh, this was at a lecture at Morocco last year. It was, you had to do the, the lecture selfie. Um, we had uh, events. We did a leadership summit in Seattle in late 2015, so just about two years ago, um, which was really fun to do. And uh, we were happy when it was over. And um, I love meeting people like the, the IGD scholars. The scholars are some of the coolest people, students up and coming in the industry. By the way, the IGD scholarships for GDC 2018 just opened, so if you're interested in the scholarship program, you should check it out. Um, 
but uh, also meeting, like I said, with government ministers. This is the Minister of Telecommunications for Tunisia when I met him early last year. And well, the cool thing about meeting these people, you know, I, I, did, I made a specific point of reaching out to politicians especially because I want to educate them on what we do and who we are. And in this case, this is a total shock to me because this particular guy, actually when he was outside of Tunisia dirt before the revolution in 2011 and then he came back and became part of the government, he co-owned a game company in the UK. So this guy loves video games and he had this exciting plan to expand the game industry in Tunisia despite the fact the country is facing 30% unemployment, active ISIS activity, a lot of challenges they have there, but the optimism they had was, was just phenomenal to see. I did get to go to cool places too, I gotta admit. Um, it was really cool, that was the Sahara, um, that was uh, Hagia Sophia. Um, of course, because I'm such a geek, this is two years ago when I spoke at the console conference in Norway. Well, I got off the train in Finsa because you gotta go see where they film Hoth, right? And in Tunisia last year, you gotta go to the Lars homestead. <laughs> How could you not go there? Um, or earlier this year, when I was speaking in Dubrovnik for uh, the Reboot Conference, a friend of mine, we decided to recreate scenes from Game of Thrones. Because why, why else would you go there, right? Well, it's, it's a cool historical landmark too. Um, but of course, it wasn't just all about that. I mean, yes, it was fun, it was exciting, it was really energizing to do all that travel and to speak and interface with all these people, but the job was really about making change. That's why I took the job, and I'll get to why I took it later. We're gonna, this is kind of like where things were in the recent past, and we're gonna go deeper into the past and explore it a bit more. So um, I took this job because I basically drew a line in the sand and said, it's time, I'm gonna be someone who makes change. And so, um, there's a lot of stories that came out, a lot of things that we tried to do um, during this time. Um, I became known for being pretty outspoken and uh, speaking uh, sometimes maybe out of line, but I didn't care because it was important that somebody speak up and I was in a position to do so. Um, and so, you know, there's things like the IHD Developer Satisfaction Survey that I created um, out of the old quality of life survey that we used to do years ago, and so that became a, a major uh, data source for a lot of academics in the media and elsewhere. Um, all kinds of things we were doing. Some people accused me of being too political, like joining the resist jam. Why are you joining the resist jam? This is like a political thing. It's like, no, the point in joining the resist jam is to show that game developers can use their skills for things other than entertainment. I didn't care what side of the issue you're on, I cared that you were willing to use your skills to express yourself in a way that is not just pure fun and for entertainment. Um, so yeah, we did a lot of things. I, I like to think we kind of shook the pillars of heaven a bit, uh, maybe not as much as I had hoped and maybe too much in some cases, but um, I felt pretty good about it. So when I left um, back in June of this year, I joined an organization as a board member called Take This, which you might be familiar with because they run the AFK rooms at all the PAX events worldwide. And um, what a Take This focuses on mental health in the game industry, both on the developer and the gamer side. And in, in all my interactions with developers all around the world, that was one of those common denominators that I saw was a very uh, frequent problem. Dealing with depression, dealing with low self-esteem, dealing with the pressures of running an indie studio or just trying to make it on your own. Um, or even dealing with the pressures of being in a large studio and dealing with crunch and things like that all the time. And so the mental pressure is a very strong issue in our industry and I decided this is something that I wanted to be a part of. And so I joined that and of course even two days ago I was on the local TV station here promoting video games and why they're such a great force in society and too much makeup. Um, but it wasn't all fun either. I happened to be running the IGDA during probably one of the most tumultuous times in our industry. And I was not only, uh, not only the head of a game developer association, but I happened to be a woman head of a game developer association during the time of Gamergate. So I was one of the primary targets of this group. Um, it was not fun. They did all kinds of things to try and make my life colorful and problematic and traumatic and everything else. I got the death threats, I got the harassment, I was in contact with the FBI on a frequent basis. Um, I was called out for all kinds of things. Um, I gotta admit, some of it was super entertaining, like claiming I was part of the National Security Agency of the United States. I'm like, that's cool, because I'm like, if that's true, then I should have a federal budget line item of like two or three billion dollars to fund my organization. But, um, but then, you know, some of it wasn't fun at all. The, you know, digging into my past and all that kind of 
stuff like that. It was ugly. It was an ugly time. But um, I got through it. The organization got through it. We, as an industry, got through it for the most part. Um, you know, a lot of people wondered why I was wearing this T-shirt for two years at a lot of events because basically that's kind of, kind of how I felt as being this target. But you know, after a while, as I told a lot of people, once you have about a hundred arrows in your back, you don't feel the rest. You really don't. So, which is a sad part too, because you kind of just become numb to the whole thing, and it just you just wake up every morning. There's another fifty, hundred, or a hundred tweets at you with all kinds of stuff, and you're just like, meh, whatever. Um, so who am I though? I mean, so I did all this stuff. I, I ran the IHDA, we went through all that stuff. I hope I made a positive impact on this industry on a global scale. I hope in some way I elevated this industry's profile to governments and to media and to the public as well, and not to mention fostering a community within this, this industry. But why me? Who am I? I? Any one of us can apply all kinds of labels to ourselves. I mean, I can be a Myers-Briggs INTP, which I am. I'm an introvert, for real. Um, cartographer, strategist, whatever. The geek part, you probably already guessed that from the previous pictures. I can prove it even more. <laughs> so this, is, this, is, this was the day before Halloween at this conference, and so I decided to bring my costume with me. This is how much of a geek I am. I'm dressed as Indiana Jones, and I'm explaining force lightning when, when I worked on Star Wars The Old Republic. And so, yeah, it, yeah, it gets worse. Um, there's things that shaped me, though. Just like every one of us were shaped by forces in our life that kind of made us who we are. And I, when I look back on my life, because I would venture to say I'm a lot older than most of you here, because I am. I may have a daughter who's turning 30 next week. So, yeah, I'm old. So, um, but some things really shaped my, my future and my path into this industry. So going back, like, how did I get here? How did I take that advocate's journey that I never intended to take? One of the major influences on my life was the space program. So I was about this age when I watched on my grandmother's black and white TV the landing on the moon in 1969. I remember it like it was yesterday. I, that's not me, but I'm just saying that's similar. That's exactly what I was doing, glued to the TV. I could not believe what was going on. Of course, some people don't. But anyway, <laughs> that's not my problem. I happen to live in a country right now where conspiracy tends to be the norm. So, um, and this too, M Tolkien's map of Middle Earth. Why did I become a cartographer? Because of this. This map, he used cartography to bring to life a world that never existed. And so I was like, that is so cool. That is so cool. And I, heart I had artistic ability and at some point I'm like, I would love to do this. I would love to try and bring this to life. Also, Star Wars. I gotta admit, I was 12 years old when the first movie came out. So this is the day, May 25th, 1977, at Grumman's Chinese Theater in, in uh, Hollywood. Is that was the premiere. Um, I got to see it there a week later. And so 12 years old, major impact. I mean, at that time, if you can imagine, there was nothing like it at all. The first movie I ever saw in the theater was 2001, and I was terrified of it because of the space baby at the end. So. And I just like, I mean, I love sci-fi, but that was just horrific. But, um, and then of course games. This was my first game. I remember going into a department store near our house and one day this thing was there. And my friends and I, we you know, got around it. We're just like, what is this thing? Oh, you can put money in it. That sucks. But <laughs> so it means you, gotta, you gotta ask your parents. But then this thing did this little bouncy ball thing on the screen, and we we're just ever since then I was a gamer. I'm just like this. I love this. I love games, and um, so these are major influences. Now they're, some of them are for some people. It's like, well, that's not. Those are weird. Um, it's just you know. Um, but no, I'll show you why. So here's my path. This is my career path. If I look back, ever since I left high school. So the reason those two things are grayed out up there is because I didn't do them. So I was not an astronaut, darn it. And I'd pro probably never be rich enough to get myself up there. Um, but hopefully before I'm dead, it will be maybe, it'll be cheap enough, I don't know. But um, this is what I wanted to do. An astronaut did aerospace engineering. I suck at calculus, so I'm like, no, that's not gonna work for me. Said, I'm gonna be a conceptual artist on Star Wars because that's what I wanted to do. So I did industrial design for two years. I improved my drawing skills tremendously. I got down that storyboard style that they use, but then I really started hating my professors and the program, and I just got really bitter and rebellious. So on a total whim, I said, you know what? 
I love maps, I love culture, I love travel, I love all these things. I'm going to change my major to geography and cartography. I did that, and so got my bachelor's degree, worked for a year as a cartographer, got my master's degree in which I was doing virtual reality research. This is back in 90, 91. So I did my master's thesis in 91 on virtual reality and cartography. Um, back then the technology was five times more expensive and five, five times slower, so it didn't really work that well. I got pulled into Microsoft to work on a card encyclopedia in the early 90s, and I, I thought it was just gonna be a six month contract, just cartographer, you know, I'm making some money, I, I just got married, I mean, literally got the call the day after I got home from my honeymoon, hey, I need your help. Um, so I went over to Microsoft for six months, turned down to 13 years, and 13 year career. While I was at Microsoft, I created an internal team called Geopolitical Strategy, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then I went on to leave Microsoft 2005, consulted on games, then I became, got involved in the IGDA, became the executive director, then I went back to my, culture, my consulting work, which I'm doing now, and now I'm just a raging advocate, and we'll talk about that more. So, oops. Um, so yeah, I look back on my career, and at this point in my career, this is not now, this is a, several years back, I'm like, okay, what have I accomplished with myself? Okay, I created this team at Microsoft that didn't exist, and it's still there to this day, so that makes me proud. It's actually bigger than it was when I was there. Um, I've worked on just about every Microsoft game when I was there, between 94 and 05. All the Halos, Fables, Age of Empires, I worked on all of that stuff. I've gotten to work on many things since then. I created the geopolitical team at Google, and they heard what I did at Microsoft, so they said, hey, come and help us out. So I did, for six years. I worked on stuff I will never be able to talk about. Um, <laughs> And uh, I've traveled a lot, um, it's been fantastic. I've had chances to explore and whatnot. I have a lot of interest. I've been a magazine columnist for 12 years, working on three books. I'm working on a documentary about disputed areas of the world because I think it's a great way to teach geography. Um, and I'm doing all kinds of consulting on games and other stuff. So great, woohoo. Um, what's the problem? So I had a huge problem, a crisis a few years ago. And this is before I was kind of in advocate mode. But I was at a point in my life where I, I was kind of like, okay, what do I want to do next? I left Microsoft, I was, in, I was doing consulting, and I'm just like, you know, and I, what, I was in my early 40s at the time, so I'm just like, okay, what am I gonna do? Well, one of the big problems I was having was the matrix. Um, but let me explain. So I was, I'm a huge fan of movie scores. It's another part that makes me a major geek. I love movie scores. It's like the number one thing I listen to. So. So in, I live in Seattle, so one time the Seattle Symphony was doing this concert, of, and Don Davis, the composer of the music for The Matrix, he was there and he conducted the Seattle Symphony while you watched the film you know, above the stage. It was awesome, I love that kind of stuff. So I've seen this film, the original film that is, not the others. Um, <laughs> The, I, you know, I've seen this film many, many times, but I'd been thinking at the time, what is wrong with me? You know, what, what, what no, that's not what I was thinking, but, <laughs> no, what I was, I was having a real problem with imposter syndrome, and this, I'm, I'm gonna warn you now, we're going into a slight divergence into imposter syndrome, so this is a public service announcement. Um, but it was, it did affect my career, and it f affected what happened afterwards. So I was dealing with this issue of, Impo feeling like an imposter. And what, so what was happening is every single time I would email a client, I'd be hyper nervous. Like, what are they gonna say? I'm, I got it wrong. I don't know what, you know, I'm so nervous. And every single time, and this is at a point when I had already been doing this work for 20 years. 20 years I've been doing this culturalization work and geopolitical advice for companies. I'd never gotten anything wrong in all that time. And yet every single time I worked on a project, I was still thinking, this is the time. This is the time I will, make, I will get it wrong. And so I'm, I go to this concert. I'm watching The Matrix. I'm thinking about this in the back of my head, and we get to this part. We all know this part probably. If you haven't seen it, I'm sorry, but you should watch this movie. Um, it's the good one. Um, but this part where Morpheus says to Neo, the main protagonist, he says, don't think you are, know you are. He says this, and so I'm sitting there in the symphony hall, and I start bawling my eyes out. And my friend I was with, they're like, what is wrong with you? It's like, they're like, it's not that emotional. Uh, so I'm just like, I will tell you later. But what hit me, and it hit me super hard in this moment because I'd been dwelling on this about this point, is that I did not believe in my own skills. 
And I had to remember that disbelief in my own skills does not make them disappear. It doesn't mean I don't have them or they're invisible to people around me. It's just that I don't believe them. It's like, that's the problem. It's not that I don't have them. It's just I don't believe them. And so even though there's a mountain of evidence that I had in front of me looking back over my career that I could do these things, I was capable. And so what I realized in that moment, even though it took me a while to kind of process why I was just being so emotional about it, but you have to know that the reality, you have to know that reality of what others perceive in you. You have to know it. You have to have it in your head. Even if you think, you struggle to think that you have the skills or not, you have to put that struggle part and downplay it as much as you can. In other words, listen to what people are telling you. Artists, writers, coders, whoever you are, when people look at your art and say, oh my God, you're amazing, you're so good. You're like, oh, it sucks, I hate it. You know, I, my writing sucks, my code stinks. You know, whatever it might be, we all struggle with this to some degree. So just to, here's the more, the PSA part. So imposter syndrome, this is typically what it looks like. So you're in that little circle. This is what I think I, this is what I know and everyone else around me knows a hell of a lot more than I do and they always will. It'll always be this problem. Where in the reality of it is that what you know is pretty much commensurate with what everyone around you knows. We all have special areas of knowledge and even if you're in a group where it's like a whole bunch of artists, nobody will ever be your kind of artist. You know, one thing that you, you will always have your own style regardless. It might be similar to somebody else's, but it's still yours. That's the thing. You have to embrace the fact that your uniqueness makes that skill unique. It doesn't matter if you're both using Unity or ZBrush or whatever you're using, you're still unique. Now, the thing you can focus on is like, well, that person does, has a much better technique. You can improve your technique. Anybody can improve your technique. In fact, why don't you go ask that person to be your mentor? and say, hey, I'd love to learn from you. I'd love to find out how you do this. So remember this, and maybe if you need a visual aid to remember this, because you're probably already guessing what it looks like, is that there's a Death Star and a flower. <laughs> so think about the flower. Don't think about the Death Star or the imposter that happens to ride inside it. <laughs> so, uh, so here's a couple of quotes for you to kind of keep in mind, and this will be the end of my PSA about imposter syndrome. Marcus Aurelius, this is a very old quote. Look at what he says. How much time he gains who does not look to see what his neighbor says or does or thinks, but only at what he does himself to make it just and holy. What an awesome statement. What I like even better is Mark Twain. Comparison is the death of joy. Think about that. That is a very strong statement. Kind of let that settle in for a while. And the next time you find yourself comparing yourself to somebody else, just think about that. Where's my joy going? Well, I'm basically pissing it away because I'm comparing myself to other people. Just focus on doing what you can do best. And I had to go through this point. I had to kind of figure this out for myself during, during the, my, what I call my matrix, matrix crisis. So um, you have to embrace the adversity, and that's something that I had to do. I went through a period of my life where I was divorced, and all, when I was getting the divorce about seven, eight years ago, somewhere in that time, a lot of transition, a lot of things were going on in my life, so I embraced it, and it took a while to embrace it. It was not easy, because it's very emotional, it's very hard to do that, and I understand how hard it is, because every single person in this room is dealing with adversity in some form or another, whether it's something you personally are dealing with, somebody in your family, somebody you love, somebody that you're around, you're dealing with it in some form or another, because we're humans and we live in this world, therefore we do, we do experience adversity. Um, treat adversity as your crucible, because that's exactly what it is. It refines you. It's your forge that makes you different. It makes you better if you embrace it. If you reject the adversity, you're going to be stuck in that crucible for a hell of a long time, I can guarantee you, until you embrace it and understand what it is you're dealing with and kind of let it pass through you then you can kind of emerge from that. If you're following Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, they call it the supreme ordeal. The hero has to go through the supreme ordeal and they emerge from that and when they emerge from it, they're different. And so what I, the way I look at it, it's embracing your adversity eventually for me became a sense of embracing superpowers. I've got superpowers. I have skills that nobody else has just like everyone else in this room has. And so, great, I get to this point. So now what do I do? So I've got superpowers, even if they're like, you know, if, even if I'm deluding myself, I'm like, look at me, I have superpowers. I don't care if it's self-delusional, it works. <laughs> it, it, it's helped me. Um, 
we know in our literature, in, our, in a lot of our, the, the media that we consume, this is a, such a common theme. The hero's journey is everywhere. Why is it everywhere? Well, it is universal, as Joseph Campbell often mentioned. If you haven't read The Power of Myth, I recommend it. You know, Arya Stark, a bruise is a lesson, and each lesson makes us better. Or you look at things like even, you know, histor or fictionalized historical characters. How, what forces them, what makes them go from this to this? You know, what are the forces on their lives that make them go through a transition to go from that? Or, you know, from this, where, you know, very stodgy and, and formal and everything else, to rage. The line must be drawn here, this far, no further. You know, there's a transition that they go through. Like in his case, it's basically being violated in the worst kind of way and being made to do things that he never wanted to do. And I love this scene from Wonder Woman. If you've seen the movie, if you haven't, I'm sorry, I'm spoiling it, but, um, you know, sorry. Um, where Steve Trevor says to her, we can't, we can't save everyone in this war, it's not what we came to do, but she says, no, but it's what I'm going to do. And it's interesting that I've spoken to so many people about this scene, where there's men and women who are so emotional about this scene. I know I was, I was, I was, you know, have tearing up when I saw this, because it's like, that's what we want to be. We want to be that person who steps out of the trench when nobody else will. We want to have the courage to be able to step up and make change happen because you know, everyone knows it has to happen, but who has the courage to stand up and actually do it? And what I have found, at least in my own experience, it's only through your own crucible, going through that, whatever crucible you need to go through, you have to pass through that, deal with your adversity and emerge from it, embrace your superpowers, and then you feel like, okay, I can do this. I think I can do this. Now, it may t you might stumble a lot, but that's okay, but you need to start trying. So who am I? Basically, when I went through all of this process, I'm basically someone who decided to truly give a shit. That's what it came down to. I, just, I made a conscious decision that I'm going to make change happen because this phrase was stuck in my head constantly. Evil triumphs when good people do nothing. And I made a conscious decision a few years ago before I took the IGA job. Like, I am not going to be that person. I am not going to be the person who does nothing. If I see somebody who's being harassed on the street and nobody else is helping them out, I'm going to help them out. Maybe people can say, well, you have a superhero complex. So what? Whatever it is, I'm going to help. I don't care what you call it. What I, what I call it is doing the right thing. And I'm not going to let things triumph because I've just decided to turn my cheek, to walk away, to ignore it. So one of the things that was interesting when I left the IHDA a few months ago, one of my friends, they wanted to know more about, like, well, what do you do exactly? I don't really know what you do. You're like this culturalization, blah, blah, whatever. So it was a great challenge, though, because they, they challenged me to Think about it, like really think about what exactly do you do? And so I did think about it for a couple weeks. And so when I, what I came back to them with, and they agreed with me because they know me very well, I said, I think what I am is a cultural change catalyst. And the way that I change culture is in three different levels. And you look back over my career, and this is, what it, this is how it plays out. So I change culture within games. That's my culturalization work. That's the work I've been doing for 24 years in the industry, where I help developers make sure that the culture that they're exporting through the content of their games is not going to be problematic in other locales. So basically, I try and make sure that they can maximize the reach of their game content and get as many people to enjoy it as possible. So that's what I do. That's my geographic expertise. I also changed culture within companies. I created a team at Microsoft that addressed this kind of risk that they had never done before. I did it at Google. I've helped Facebook. I've helped Amazon. I've helped companies address this kind of problem because they just, they're not thinking about it. And then, of course, I also want to change the industry. I want to change the game industry. I want, so why, why do I want to change the game industry? Why do I care about the game industry? I'm a geographer. I don't belong here. You guys belong here. I don't. I mean, who the hell am I? I just wandered in backwards by having to work at Microsoft. I'm like, hey, you, help us with this game. And it just happened that I love games. So I'm like, yes, I will help you. Why do I care? You can say it's mushy, but love is the answer for me. I love games. I love you guys for making games. I am envious of you guys because of what you guys can do. You're miracle workers. You're amazing what you produce. And I love in my, in my IGDA job being able to travel the world. I see amazing games. So many cool things. Indie games, 
AAA games, it doesn't matter, VR stuff, AR stuff, mixed reality stuff, whatever it is, I don't care, it's cool. And you guys are amazing what you do. And what's, what's really cool too is just that universality of it. It's like no matter where I go, whether it's emerging markets, whether it's established markets, it's just that passion for games, which is the other thing, one of the other things that is the reason I care. I respect you guys tremendously for what you do. I have a great admiration for what you do, and I love the passion. That's one of the reasons I love being around the game industry, is the passion. It's like other creative fields have it too, but there's something unique about our field, and I think that uniqueness is that we are taking over the world. We're changing the way narrative is, is done. We're ch narrative is something that human beings have done since the beginning of time, and we're changing it. We're changing the way and we're melding that narrative structure that human beings do with technology because now we're at a time in our history where the technology is available. And so I think it's very, it's awesome to see that. That's why I care. And so I, so I care, my care fuels rage. So when I see that we are not being respected, we're not being loved, we're, you know, we're not being admired for just the cultural force and the economic force that we are, that drives rage. But it's not enough to be angry. It, you have to have righteous rage. Righteous rage is the key. Because to just be angry, anyone can be angry. We're all angry about something, I'm sure. It doesn't matter what it is. We're, we're angry about something, um, especially in the, the US right now. Um, I gotta not be political here. Um, righteous rage, it's a reactive emotion of anger in response to mistreatment, insult, malice, to a rebuke, it's a rebuke of injustice. Sounds kind of superhero-ish, yeah? Uh, I don't care, that's fine with me. So what drives my righteous rage? It's injustice. If I wanted to use one word, that's it. It's injustice. This is wrong with a capital W. Crunch is wrong, in my opinion. Lack of diversity, or the intent to not have diverse companies, active intent to not be diverse is wrong. You know, screwing over indie devs in the gray market is wrong. Making contracts that screw over indies when they're trying to get into the business is wrong. There's a lot of things in our industry that are wrong with a capital W in my opinion. Some people disagree, that's totally fine. But from my perspective, it's wrong. Um, I also get pissed off in inaction. So, when people aren't willing to get shit done, especially when it comes to these issues, that really makes me upset, um, which you can also say is complacency. It's like, well, that's the way it is. I hear that all the time in the five years running the IGDA when I talk to developers and I talk actively about a lot of these issues. A lot of times the response I would hear, it's like, well, what can you do about it? It's like, Ugh! it's like, that's the problem. It's, the problem is that you believe there's nothing that can be done about it. So just to, as a parenthetical statement here, righteous rage, you can also call it advocacy. So we use the term advocacy, which tends to be the more, you know, the, the more, uh, the calmer term. You don't go say, well, I'm a righteous rager. It's like, no, I'm, I'm an advocate. And so I like to use the term righteous rage. Um, so what, kind, what came out of that process? What was very interesting, when I came through this whole process of, of the, the kind of the adversity that I embraced and the crucible I went through and thinking about these things, a lot of my friends, especially people who knew me well, started using this term, you seem fierce. You seem fierce now. What happened to you? Why are you dressing like this now? <laughs> so I, I did have a feeling of fierce. I really did. And what's interesting too, so I started, it, and it's, it's, what I find kind of interesting is that my, I, I cosplay a lot. And um, as you can see, I love to cosplay. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, that's, that's who I am. A lot of it is because that's my daughter there on the right. She's a costume designer, for real. She's a professional costume designer. So we have a tremendous amount of fun together cosplaying. But when I was, when I put on the Thor costume for the first time, uh, which was several years ago. I remember you know, we try and do a dress rehearsal when we do our cosplay, so we know that you know it's not going to hurt like hell walking for over two hours or whatever. So we try and put on our cosplay and wear it like all day long um, before we go to like San Diego Comic Con or something. Sometimes we don't. But the very first time I wore the Thor costume, I had everything on the armor, the helmet, the hammer, everything. And I'm standing there, and we're in a car garage in San Diego because we're just getting ready early in the morning. And I'm standing there, I'm like, I couldn't contain myself. I feel so fucking kick-ass. And I just yelled it out. And she's like, okay, all right. 
um, but what was interesting, because I've been asked by a lot of people, why do you cosplay? What do, what do you get out of it? Do you like pretend you're Thor or something? I'm like, no, I, I'm not pretending to be Thor. I am Thor. <laughs> That's the difference. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> so the, the, the reason I do it, to come out of that crucible and to embrace my superpowers and, and embrace who I am as a person and embrace my desire to make change happen and to triumph over evil, when I wear the Thor costume, I tell people it's not that I'm like, you know, dreaming that I'm Thor and everything, because again, I am, but um, it's because when I wear that, it's like that's the external representation of how I feel about myself. That's what you're seeing. When you see me in that costume, looking kick-ass with a hammer and everything, it's like, that's how I feel about myself. That's where I've gotten to in my life, going from this incredibly shy, closed-off INTP person who would not even sometimes talk to my own friends, even through high school. I was so shy, ridiculously shy. I mean, if I would go back in time right now, and tell my 16-year-old self that I'm going to be standing here in front of this many people, I would have to stop my 16-year-old self from slitting her wrists. Because it's like, no, 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 it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Don't worry, it's okay. You can talk to, in front of that many people. I was super shy. So I look back on that whole path, and I'm like, that, I love it because that's how I feel about myself. I don't need the costume to feel that way, but I just love it every once in a while when I get to say, hey, look, this is who I, this is who I think I am. Um, I'm participating in Inktober. Um, I'm sure some of you are too. So I do my little cruddy drawings every day. I did mine earlier today for today. So the, one of the key words was fierce. I didn't know what to do and I was in a big hurry so I drew this and I got a lot of response because I basically said, here's my formula for being fierce. You put authenticity over adversity. So who you really are has to emerge and to be predominant over any adversity that you have. Um, because the adversity actually brings out the authenticity. You also have to have conviction over the sense of rejection. No matter how many times you're rejected, you still have to maintain conviction that this is right, this is what I want to do, this is the job I want, this is the kind of function I want, this is what I, I, the path I want, and keep being persistent. And of course, you have to have willpower. A lot of it just comes down to willpower with no fear. And that is a long process to go through. I know for myself, it's taken me many, many years to get to that point where I, where I honestly feel fearless. Now, part of it, I think, is age. I've, I've, I've been around long enough to know kind of how the world works and how you can kind of you give and take. You go have ups and downs, and eventually you're going to continue to emerge. So, okay, you take all of that stuff. So now I've got this, this fierce person who likes to cosplay. I'm in the game industry, and of course, you know the history with that. I went in, ran the IHDA, and I've been involved in game development for a while. So we've got this industry that we're a part of. Now, this is the definition of industry. Um, we don't need to dwell on that very much. The problem is that it connotes something like this. That we often think of industry as being a machine, that you know people are cogs that you stick in the machine, and honestly, a lot of larger companies sometimes tend to treat game developers as cogs in a machine, and uh, it's not something that we like to see. Um, a lot of practices around that, or if they actually view you as a human being, it's a human being in something like this. You don't know what this is. This is the movie Brazil, which you should also see. Um, so it's just, it's just this huge machine, you know, uh, assembly line kind of thing. But the reality is that the industry, whenever we say industry, it's people. The people are the industry. We are the industry. So a lot of times I talk to developers who would like to say, this, this industry sucks or this sucks or that sucks. So yeah, you can kind of view it as like this overall thing, but guess what? The industry is us. It's us. We make the industry what it is. And so if we don't like that damn industry, well then change it. We're part of the industry. We are the industry. You know, it's made of people. So this is like, this is a company in, uh, in Europe that uses this on the back of all their company t-shirts. Our number one game is our people. I like that. It's the right message. Um, and so we have an industry that continues to face a lot of problems in the public, in my view. And, and again, this view is based on five years of interacting with government officials, people outside the game industry, people you know, in the general public. And we still have a huge problem with the narrative of our industry, a huge problem. So video games cause violence and are evil. Uh, video games are a waste. Um, you know, video games cause violence. 
uh, you know, on and on it goes. You know, the idea of, you know, of course, a lot of this happens in the U.S. too because of a massive gun problem. But you know, uh, that video games need to have a warning label that it, they will cause violence. Just like it says there, it has been linked to aggressive behavior. Bullshit. It hasn't. It has not been proven. But it, that narrative keeps getting pushed. So who controls the public narrative about our profession, about who we are and what we do? Guess what? It's not us. Because if it was, these, these perceptions would not be persistent. We would have some control over it, but we don't. And this is what pisses me off. After five years in interacting with so many people, we understand it, but what I have found often is that we on the inside of the industry, which is us, is that we're more or less, we tend to be more complacent about the narrative. And so, narratives like this, I still hear this stuff every day when I'm out there interacting with the public. That games are played mostly by boys, you know, young boys. Um, they're a waste of time. They do cause violence. They do cause obesity. They will rot your brain. The game developers are lazy. They're motivated by money, which obviously they don't know game development. <laughs> Because I would say, yeah, if, uh, let's like I told a developer um, that I met uh, in another country a few years, or not, a few, a few months ago, and I, he said, well, he's like, why do you want to make games? Because I want to make money. It's like banking and real estate, dude, not game development. Um, people who can't do real jobs, so we are just kind of do games instead because it's frivolous. And we only like making violent stuff, of course. All of these narratives are out there. Okay, so we have trade associations all around the world, and I could post tons more logos, but trade ex this is an example of trade associations. Now, when I entered the IGDA, I have a good relationship with a lot of trade associations when I was running the IGDA, even though we were a professional association, not a trade association, but I always assume that these people are helping with that narrative, that they're the ones helping to shape the narrative. And on one level, they are, the narrative with the government. And that is, for a lot of these groups, that is their chief function. They try and make sure the government in their locale is, is basically behaving themselves when it comes to video games and understanding what video games are and what an what a economic force they are and trying to get tax breaks and all that other good stuff. They serve an important function, like the ESA, for example, in the US was completely instrumental in securing the 2011 Supreme Court decision that games are free speech. That was a major, major event in the US for game content. Um, and it hasn't stopped the problem there with, with politicians trying to control games, but it certainly has put a huge blocking issue for any politician who wants to change or who wants to, to affect games. So who controls the narrative? I, I contend it's not the trade associations, because they're more focused on that government to industry interaction. Well, what about developers? Well, we have professional associations here and there that do some part, but it's like, what about that sliver, though, of who talks to the public? Who's shaping that common narrative across the world, across the industry, that gets put out to the public? And um, the answer right now, to, in my perception, is nobody is, really. And so who needs to do it? In my opinion, it's us. We need to do it, because it's our profession. It's like we're the ones that they're talking about. This is information from the, the developer satisfaction survey. And you can see here, you may not be able to read that well, but when we ask this question, what factors do you feel create the public's negative perception of the game industry? You can see a lot of the issues, sexism, working conditions, perceived link to violence, all of that. Well, look at the difference, though, between 2015 and 2016, every single factor went up, which means that developers themselves are basically saying that everything is worse, <laughs> that the public is perceiving that all of these things are even more, you know, linked to video games. It's like, we don't want that. That's not, and it's not even true necessarily. I mean, some of these are definitely issues we need to address. We know that. But at the same time, it's like, this is a huge problem. Or we asked, do you feel there's equal, equal treatment opportunity for all in the game industry? Again, between one year, look at the change. The yes dropped by 13%. That's the wrong direction. We don't want it going that way. Uh, so what's, what is going on here? Um, or another one, do you, this is a good one though. How important would you rate the following? Diversity in the workplace in general versus in the game industry versus in game content. All of those went sharply up in one year. That's great, that is the right direction. So obviously, the people responding to the survey, which was global, about 48% was in the US and the rest was the rest of the world. Um, and it was about 70% men and 20% and, and, uh, women. Um, 
and the rest were like un other or unspecified. And um, so this is great, okay? Diversity is important. We, we the industry, the de developers, we believe that it's important. So, but is it changing? Not really. It's not changing quickly. Um, Crunch as well, you know, some countries experience crunch a lot, some don't, some have federal labor laws that protect them against crunch and some don't. Um, but again, basically most developers feel it's not necessary. We don't need to crunch. Um, oftentimes when I used to give lectures about crunch, I had a slide that said crunch in most other businesses, it's called poor project management. But in the game industry, it's this, you know, heroic rite of passage. That's the wrong crucible. I'm not talking about that crucible. Um, so, and, and of course, again, it affects, our, it affects our mental health. This is, I'm gonna do a plug for Take This because if you have not read this white paper that came out last year um, called Crunch Hurts, it's fantastic. It's about 14 pages, quick read, has all kinds of interesting medical statistics about what crunch actually does to you. And the fact that, that in, for human beings, which assuming all of us are, um, you get about two weeks worth of crunch out of people, and after that, there's basically no ROI from a medical standpoint. The human body and the human brain cannot sustain that kind of ongoing work. And it, they actually also link the fact that the greater the crunch, the lower the Metacritic scores, um, which is that's not really, that's usually the exact opposite of what crunch is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be making the game a lot better. Um, anyway, another PSA over. So, people say change can't happen quickly. It's too hard, it's arduous. Look at this guy. Y'all know who he is, right? Harvey Weinstein in Hollywood. Look how far and hard he has fallen in such a short amount of time. Now, some people will say, well, it wasn't fair, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter. The problem is, I mean, it's pretty clear the amount of evidence that this guy's sexual predatory behavior was so rampant that Hollywood even made jokes about it in different TV shows and on award shows. They actually reference it openly that this guy was a predator and that this guy was someone to avoid and yet they still tolerated this guy you know over and over again and yet very quickly in a very quick flash of lightning this guy has fallen so hard and so for people when i talk to them they say well change how it's going to take a long time it's going to be really tough we're going to have to have many working groups and we're going to have to have all this other stuff bullshit it doesn't take time it takes willpower it takes people collectively willing to come together. What about this guy? Bill O'Reilly also fell pretty hard. What about this guy? The Google memo dude. Now, he hasn't necessarily fallen, but he's, he's you know, well, he's fallen in other ways. Um, he certainly, he, may, he might be a hero to some people, but for most people, the guy is a douchebag. Um, and so, you might agree with him? That's fine. I don't care if you agree with him, but I'm just saying that Change in, these, in this day and age is, is more punctuated than it used to be. Part of that's due to social media, part of it's due to the technology that we leverage, that we uh, were able to make things happen faster. And so basically what I'm saying is for our industry, for us, for the things that we want to see change in this industry, we can change it a lot faster than we think we can. And we don't need to be complacent about it. Again, evil triumphs when good people do nothing. You think about the Harvey Weinstein case, that's exactly what happened here. That's exactly what happened. All the people who are complicit with his behavior, they all knew and they didn't do anything about it. And so we can, do, we can decide to look at a case like that and say, I'm gonna make the change. I'm gonna be the one who stands up and does something. Here's another example, FX Networks. It's a network mostly in the US. So the CEO, was, this was back during the time where like, the actress Jennifer Lawrence was being vocal about the, her wage gap in Hollywood and there was the issue with the Oscars and the lack of diversity. So it was a very timely issue a couple, few years ago. So in the 2014-2015 season, only 12% of the directors of their shows were women or people of color. In 2016 and 2017, it was 51% in one year difference. So what happened? Basically, it's a will. The CEO, this is what he said, they just happened to be working in a system that was biased, we weren't taking responsibility or stepping up or acknowledge that and, and saying, okay, we will be the change. And he did a great interview last year where he just said, we'll be the change. He says, it doesn't take focus groups and research. He said, I'm the CEO. I just said, do it, and that's it, and it happened. Why don't we have that kind of leadership in the game industry? 
Why aren't CEOs of companies willing to say, you know what, you're right, crunch does burn people out and, make, and drain their passion from working in games. That's why they're fleeing to Google or Facebook or other companies where they'll still work hard, but they're going to not work as hard. They're not going to be ground into the dirt because of their passion. We don't see that same kind of thing happening across the tech sector. In some cases, yes, but generally speaking, why are games so unique that they have to have that kind of production behavior? The answer is they don't. They just don't. It's just something that we continue to perpetuate. So what can we do? We need to focus on the cause over the fear. Now, when, I, when I've talked about this issue before, I've had people say, well, that's fine for you. You've gone through your crucible, and you're, look, you're like all fearless now and all this stuff. It's like the, the, the reality is we can all reach a point of fearlessness because it does take courage to stand up. Trust me, I know. It's like when you take, when I go back to that time, I remember the day in August of 2014 when I spoke out against Gamergate and what happened to me as a result of that and the targeting that I got as a result of it. I would do it again in a heartbeat and I would do it even more so than I did back then, knowing what I know now. So I wish I did have a time machine. Well, I can do a lot of things with the time machine. But, uh, um, but you have, to, you have to focus on the cause. That's what kept me going through it the entire two years of that level of harassment. It's the righteous rage. This is wrong. This reaction is wrong. This harassment of women is wrong. And I'm not going to stand for it. And I don't care if I'm the one who takes the arrows. I'm willing to take the arrows if they don't have to. That may sound like a martyr complex. Go ahead and crucify me. I don't care what it sounds like. But I'm willing to take it because somebody has to. Now imagine if every single person felt that way. What a huge wall of resistance that would be. And so it, we wouldn't just be causing ripples, you'd be causing tsunamis throughout the industry with that kind of collective action. So we have to be relentless against injustice. You have to be willing to be relentless against it and not let complacently, complacency take over. And I understand it's not, we can't all be on all the time. We, we can't all be focused that intently all the time on these issues because let's face it, we have work, we have family, we have other things that we want to do in our life than just justice, you know, and that's fine. Some people are going to be focused on that, some people won't, but the idea is that we have to not let it escape our thinking. We have to remember that if we're working in this space that we love and enjoy and are passionate about, we have to maintain that level of um, intent, the level of diligence is the word I'm looking for. We also have to fervently support each other because this is not something we do alone. It's something we do together. Again, industry is us. We have to keep remembering that. We want the industry to be better, then we have to help each other out. We have to be willing to step up and help each other, to mentor people around you, to seek out a mentor if you think you need one, to reach out to people who need help. That's one of the things, again, I love about this industry, unlike others that I've been around, is that the willingness to help each other. And in some communities, like I've seen here in Melbourne, as well as some others around the world, it's like there's this, just this amazing connectivity between people that they're willing to talk to each other and help each other out in not a competitive way. It's just like, yeah, I'll help you with that. I, can, I know how to code that. I'll show you how to do it. I know how to do that in, in this program or whatever it might be. You know, I'll help, you, I'll help show you how to write this narrative structure. It's like that kind of willingness is so awesome to see and it's in that level of collaboration. And finally, it's about acting with collective will. And collective is the key word. Because we can all act with will, but it's to be collective, which means common cause, common front, working together, being willing to step out. Now, a lot of people have asked me many times, actually, is there going to be a union in the game industry? And I've had many discussions about this with people over the years when I was running the IGDA and, and since I left the IGDA. And this has been a huge point of topic for, for a long time. Now, when we did the, the developer satisfaction survey, the, the one, one thing I can tell you is that in the years that we did the survey, the, the interest in unionization has continually increased. And so what does that tell you? It tells you that I think a lot of developers are looking for a way to improve our industry some way, and a lot of people feel that maybe collective action is the way to do it. Is that the answer? I don't know. I do know that when I was running the IGD, I was approached three times by Hollywood unions who basically came in and said, hey, we'd love to proselytize and get members from your community. And I basically said, uh, no, because, um, not because I'm necessarily anti-union, it's because my belief is that Hollywood-style unions are not going to work. They're not going to work for us. For example, do you ever think 
that a producer joining the producers guild, for example, is ever going to have the same level of respect as producers who are in the guild like Spielberg, Scorsese, all of these like massive Hollywood names who are, who are movie producers. Do you think they'd ever have the same level of respect? I don't. I think they'd always be treated as second class citizens. You know, because, oh, you're just working on games. You know, we're working on film. And it's just like, you know, and I, I, love, I love films, okay? I, I really do. I'm obviously, I'm a huge movie geek. Um, but nonetheless, it's just like, there has to be another solution. There has to be another way. Whether or not collective unionization is an answer, I don't know what the answer is. But I do know that collective will has to be enforced in one way or another. So, um... Did I do that right? Yes, yeah, sorry. So if you're tired of all my superhero quotes, um, I'm going to show this instead, because Mother Teresa, if you don't know who this is, she's, she was amazing. Um, look at this quote, that we ourselves feel that we are doing, well, what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean, but the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. So when you think that, well, I'm just one person, I'm not going to make a difference. It's like every punctuated event in human history was caused by one person for the most part. Think of the people who, who made change in history. It's one person who had the will to do something and people followed them, you know, or they followed their footsteps. Like she says here, if you can't feed 100 people, then feed just one. And I've actually had people say to me, what are you trying to do? Change the world. I'm like, no, just my corner of it. The game industry, that's the corner I've chosen that I want to see it improve and I want to see it be better. And so that's it. That's my battleground. That's what I've chosen because that's, I'm passionate about it and I love you people. So there's nothing at this site yet, so don't even bother looking at it. <laughs> but it will be up soon. So what, what is this? So it's basically, it's just me. It's me doing my style of advocacy. But what I'm going to do is basically my style of adv advocacy is as you might imagine, kind of aggressive and kind of blunt. So I'm going to be reporting on very specific issues and there's going to be a whistleblowing feature. I want people to be able to not be fearful about speaking up about crap going on to them or in their company or other behaviors going on. And as a result of that, I plan to do public collective action on very specific targets. Think Weinstein in the game industry. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Some people think, no, nah, I don't think I, I don't like that idea. Well, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I don't care if anyone follows me in this or not. I feel that we need this kind of punctuated change. I know it can happen. I know I think it can improve the industry in certain ways, and it's something that I'm planning to do. And so hopefully, I have to end with another superhero thing. Um, I love this quote. This is actually from the Wonder Woman comic book, not from the movie. Um, but when they asked Wonder Woman how strong she was, she replied, I don't really know. It's difficult to find an upper limit against which to test myself. What an awesome place to be. You know, that's something that I actually have felt that through my career and my history and going through my crucible and going through the IGDA leadership, which was a crucible as well, in shaping who I am in this industry and just as a person and as a professional, I've kind of reached a point where I start feeling this way. And I don't want to say I'm a glutton for pain, because <laughs> I'm not a masochist, but you start feeling like, I can do this. I can do this. I, or, I got through that. I can do this too. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. So what I'm saying is that spirit of, of endurance is contagious. It's contagious within yourself. The more you do it, the more you overcome, the more you realize, I actually am pretty kick-ass. I can do this. And I can do other things that I may not have done before. That's like why the reason I took the IGD job in the first place. Like I thought, Maybe I should try a leadership role. That would be kind of cool. I, I think I might be able to do this. Now, whether or not I actually did it well, that's for history and others to decide. But I, I enjoyed what I did, and I hope I made an impact at the time. So the last thing I'm going to mention here is this, uh, this Latin quote. You might know it. Fiat justitia ruat calum. If you don't know what that means, it means let justice be done, though the heavens fall. So now at this point, in my advocacy, in my, advocate, my advocate's journey, this is where I am. And some people might say, this seems kind of reckless, that you, know, you don't care if the heavens fall. It's like, no, because I want justice to be done. I'm tired of bullshit. I'm tired of making excuses. I'm tired of complacency. There, and there is, let's be honest, there's an age factor too, because you know, I'm going to be 53 in February. I don't care about saying that, that I'm over 50 and I'm female, so I'm doubly screwed in this industry. But um, 
I don't mind mentioning that because I don't want to wait. I've had a lot of people t you know, tell me, well, you know it's going to change, right? Society is going to change. They will accept games, and I, I totally know that. They've done it with every other media form that's come out, with film, with TV, with rock and roll, with radio. All of those different forms of media were eventually accepted and embraced by all of society. And so games will not be any different, but guess what? I don't want to wait. I'm not going to wait 10, 20, 30 years to see it happen because we, don't, we shouldn't have to wait. And so that's my impatience. And so if you want to call that wrong, that's fine. But that's, that's my righteous rage speaking. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. <laughs> Sorry. That's OK. Um, Tex up the back. I'm going to need some help just for, just for one second, because I need to put my laptop in. So let's, while you all bear with me, because I've been writing my closing speech during Kate's keynote. Um, <laughs> because. I wonder, uh, I wonder what you were doing over there. Yeah, no, I was working away on that. Because um, I was intending to do it uh, in the break, uh, but Ali and I went over in our talk. Uh, we had a bottle of wine uh, for those who weren't there. Uh, and it, it, was, it was a great time. Uh, and I think everyone, everyone learned a lot. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it went a little over. So just give me one second. Yeah, Somewhere yeah. here. I'll get out of the stuff. HDMI. Oh, that one. Is this where I start singing the girl from Ipanema? <laughs> where is my cursor? Meanwhile, <laughs> I'm doing a jigsaw puzzle with myself. Somewhere, somewhere on this screen. Yeah, yeah I got it all. Anyway. Nah. It's fine. I can do it from my phone, which is... Kate, do you have my phone by any chance? No, it's my phone. Oh. My phone should be here. Oh, wait. Are you sure you don't have my phone? Oh, no. We have the same case. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Thank you. No, it's okay. Did I... I think that you took yours as well. Oh, so. I did. Oh. I'm a klepto, too. <laughs> oh, well. Excellent. All right. So, thankfully, I also emailed this to myself uh, because I figured that there was going to be some kind of technical problem, uh, as there usually is. So, thank you so much, Kate. <laughs> that was an incredible keynote and illustrates a lot of why I personally love this industry and why I'm so passionate about advocating for change. Um, before we go any further, uh, I want to talk a bit about our absolutely incredible sponsors. Um, they, <laughs> without GCAP, with, without GCAP, without our sponsors, there would be no GCAP. Um, our sponsors work incredibly hard. They put a lot of money and time into making GCAP what it is. I want to call out uh, Creative Victoria, who has supported GCAP uh, for the last three years, and then the last, the two years before that, and a bunch of years before that. Um, Epic Games, who have supported the Australian Game Developer Awards since the very beginning. I don't know if Jay is here, but we love you, Jay. Um, this year, on, we had Microsoft come on board as a premium sponsor, which was hugely exciting. Um, Microsoft have done some incredible talks, and they allowed us to do GCAP Assist again this year. Um, which enabled us to give 30 incredible people tickets to GCAP to, to be here with us today. Um, Yodo One became a premium, premium sponsor this year, and Yodo One have worked incredibly hard to bring brilliant Australian games to the rest of the world. Our gold sponsors are Cheetah Mobile, Hipster Whale, and Film Victoria. Our silver sponsors are Mighty Games, LDB, 
Big Ant Studios, League of Geeks, Unity, and EA Fire Monkeys. And I'll, I'll get back to EA Fire Monkeys in a second, okay? Our, our bronze sponsors are Screen Queensland, Ad Colony, and Mighty Kingdom. Our indie gold sponsors are Mini Mega and the Interactive Games and Entertainment Association. Our indie bronze sponsors are IGDA Sydney, Well Placed Cactus, Ultima, Sponge Games, Samurai Punk, and Tin Man Games. Can we all get a round of applause for all those amazing sponsors for putting in the money to help make this event happen? I also want to make a special thank you to an anonymous donor who uh, gave us a chunk of money that allowed us to bring a bunch of women to GCAP this year. Thank you so much. Now, I said that we would come back to EA Fire Monkeys, and uh, so who checked out the student showcase in the hall? Yeah? Awesome. Who thought it was pretty awesome? There were some incredible games. Uh, these teams are the future of our industry. And um, when I went to talk to EA Fire Monkeys about how they wanted to contribute to GCAP, uh, they immediately jumped at the chance to support the student showcase. Uh, and the first thing they said was, um, can we give them a prize? <laughs> and it took us a little while, but we got there. And, and so thanks to EA Fire Monkeys, we have an incredible prize of $1,000 to give to the team that wins the student showcase. So the games that were in the student showcase, in case you didn't know, are Harvest Hands by God Goblin Hammer Games, Unbi Unbo <laughs> Unbond by HP2, Carter by Amusement, Lacuna by Team Fourth Eye, Komarebi by Finest Hour Productions, and Just Barely by Daniel Roberts. The winner of the student showcase is Carter by Amusement. Can I get you guys to come up on stage with me? Are the Carter gang in the room? Come, no, come here. <laughs> so, Carter is a unique, intelligent take on the platform and puzzle genres. And we can't wait to see what this team has coming next. So, thank you so much. So we're at the end of GCAP, um, and the end of GCAP for me is always a bit of a bittersweet time. Uh, it's a time of celebration because we've all experienced this incredible event together. Um, hopefully we've made new friends, we've learnt new techniques, laughed a lot, maybe some of us have cried, I hope there's not been too much crying. Um, I certainly know that uh, Abby's baby has cried a little bit. And, Thank you, Baba, for sticking with us. Um, GCAP has become a really crucial part of, of my life. Through GCAP, I'm lucky to have met some of the best people in my life. I'm in an incredible group of people who support me, teach me, and lift me up. To show me how I can be better and how to better myself. To call me out when I do wrong. To be there for me when I face adversity. Stephen Carla talked about the importance of creating communities. And GCAP's helped me to create the most incredible community and family that I know. I feel so, and I wrote here, hashtag blessed, <laughs> to be part of this incredible community before me. I'm so privileged to have, been, to have helped run GCAP for the past five years, to have been the event manager for the past three years, and to have completely stolen it from Tony this year. Tony handed me, to the rain, handed me the reins to GCAP at the start. Uh, and after three years, it's time for me to hand them back. It's time for me to embark on a new, terrifying adventure. GCAP's been one of the best and most hilariously difficult, infuriating, and wonderful parts of my life for the last half decade. So I have some thanks to make. First, to you. You are GCAP. 
You are what makes this event what it is. As I said at the beginning, we can provide the space, we can bring amazing speakers to, to teach you, um, we can provide excellent food, which I hope you have enjoyed, we can bring coffee, um, and we can give you a theme to, to run with. But you are the heart and soul of GCAP, so thank you. To our incredible speakers, some of whom have literally traveled from the other side of the world to be here, a bunch of them on their own dime too. GCAP's special, and that's because of you too. Uh, and I hope I don't cry when I say this one. Um, uh, to Tony Reid, uh, who I think it was in 2014 uh, thanked me and called me a, a giant of a man. And at the time, <laughs> that was one of the best things that anyone has ever told me. It was incredibly validating. Uh, it was at a time in my life when uh, I was still trying to work out who I was and how I fit into this community. And you helped showed me the way. Um, you've been there for me in times of strength, in times of weakness. Um, and you have taught me how to be a better person. Thank you. Where's Giselle? Somewhere here. Yeah. Yay! Giselle, you've always been there for me, even when I didn't know it. And I can't tell you how much I've appreciated that over the years. Uh, you've been a constant force in my life. And I just thank you. To Kamina, our great glitter queen. <laughs> Kamina is the, the spirit of GCAP. She is our muse. Um, where is she? I can't. Yay! Um, Kamina is a powerhouse of charm and humor and love and everything that I aspire to be. Thank you. And Kamina is also the volunteer coordinator of GCAP and actually makes this shit run. <laughs> um, and without her, there's no way that this event would, you know, function. So can we get a huge round of applause for Cam? <laughs> and this year, um, as part of my hostile takeover of GCAP, um, I decided that I needed some help. Uh, GCAP this year is over a thousand people. In fact, I think it's somewhere around a thousand and forty. GCAP loading was a hundred and ninety, I think. Uh, and these two incredible women uh, supported us for the last few months um, and gave us many laughs. Um, helped us through some incredibly difficult situations and have been some of the most supportive and incredible people mm -hmm. that I've ever had the privilege of working with. Um, Pritika Sakdev and uh, Emily Dalia, I love you. Thank you so much for your help this year. Can we give them a huge round of applause? <laughs> Um, I want to thank a group who don't often get thanks at these things, which is the, the board of the Game Developers Association of Australia. Um, they put on a lot of work behind the scenes uh, to help support us as an industry and to make events like GCAP happen. Thank you for letting me do this um, and for supporting Tony in the incredible things that he does. You can, all, you can give him a round of applause, it's okay. To the incredible team at MCEC, um, to our tech staff, you, this event has run flawlessly thanks to you, so thank you so much. Um, 
I think that uh, <laughs> two, there were two people in Tony and I's lives uh, who deal with us at our best and our worst. Uh, and during Games Week, it's often at our worst. Um, my partner Sebastian and uh, Tony's wife Vic are incredibly long-suffering, put up with us uh, in times when we come home and all we want to do is sit quietly because everything is on fire <laughs> and just... Um, so a huge thank you to them as well. Finally, to me, like the most important group. <laughs> um, our volunteers. Uh, our volunteers are, I don't even know how to thank them. I wrote a couple of paragraphs earlier today um, and uh, I'm just gonna, I, I literally can't. Um, you know, I will. I was getting to the joke of I literally can't even. <laughs> um, but particularly we want to thank um, Lewis, Claire and Issy, who have stepped up in a tremendous way this year to make this event possible. Can I please get all of the volunteers to come on stage? Um, you are incredible people with hearts and souls of gold. Oh God, please don't fall. <laughs> you are all incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so now I get to hand back over. There are so many of them. Like, I think when, when I first um, was the assistant event manager in 2014, we had like half of that. It's so scary to think that we've doubled in size <laughs> since then. Um, and they've been incredible all the way. Now I get to hand off. Um, I don't have a lot of words left, and I'm a person of many words. Thank you. is pretty extraordinary. Um, the first thing I'm going to say uh, relates quite strongly to Kate's talk. Um, and I do need you to listen very carefully. Incidents of inappropriate conversations and behaviours were brought to my attention. In advance of the awards tonight, and just in general, I'm going to remind you that we have a very strict code of conduct. If you see or hear something and you're confident enough to stand up to it, please do. We will have your backs. We will be your shields. If you are not comfortable enough, come and find me or any one of my team. We have got you. Inappropriate behavior will absolutely not 
be tolerated here or in the industry at all. Okay. Um, actually, you you didn't get to see their faces. So so while I'm I'm um, I'm talking, Pritika, Emily, uh, Annie, where, could you come? Liam, could you come back up? Yeah, they're here. Uh, um, so so here we are. At, uh, no no, you're coming back up. Um, and, and and like Liam said, I, I really I want to thank all of our speakers for sharing your knowledge and your insights. Um, to all of our sponsors for believing in GCAP and, and allowing us to to make this happen. Um, this is, it is a mountain of work. Um, Farah, where are you? No, Farah. Um, it is a mountain of work over and above all the other work that GDA does on a daily basis. And, and, uh, can you go that way, please? There you go. Um, and this, this is my incredible team. This, this is, these are my rocks. Um, that every day I have lent on, they have seen me at my absolute worst and have always had my back. So, as loudly as possible, because you wouldn't be here with, without them, please, this, show them your appreciation. This is... <laughs> Um, finally, um, as Lim said, I have to thank you. Um, you make our little conference awesome and amazing. And I, I get that it's not little, but astonishingly, you've managed to keep that spirit of community and friendship that was born when, when GCAP was just a tiny little thing. I don't know how you did it. But I'm truly and deeply grateful that you have. It's different, and it's a joy to be among you. Um, thank you so much for your love and support of, of us and of GCAP. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for all the hugs and smiles. Um, have a wonderful Games Week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah,